Hello everyone, welcome back to the Revisions Chemistry Review Series. In this video, we are going to talk about the periodic table. <clears throat> so let's talk about the history of the periodic table um, and what the organization looked like in the past, what does it look like today. So the first ever periodic table was given to us by Dmitry Mendeleev, who was a Russian chemist. Um, so Mendeleev organized the periodic table based on increasing atomic mass. So uh, this is what the, peri the historical periodic table looked like. Um, and Mendeleev observed that uh, there were similar, similar chemical and physical properties um, for the elements at regular intervals. So this was used as the foundation for the modern periodic table. And the most important thing to remember about the modern periodic table is that it's arranged based on the increasing atomic number, not the atomic mass. Please do not get this question wrong. There's like a very high chance that this question is going to show up on your exam. Um, okay, so um, Henry Moseley was the person who used the x-rays to determine the atomic number of the elements. And so once again, uh, it was noticed that elements do have similar chemical and physical and chemical properties at regular intervals. So this led to the periodic law that once again was the foundation for our modern periodic table. So periodic law states that the <clears throat> properties of elements um, are the periodic function of their atomic numbers, meaning at specific intervals we notice similar chemical properties, which was used to figure out where specifically should each element be in the periodic table. So this is what our modern periodic table looks like. It's given to you on page 9 in your reference table packet. Um, if you talk about the organization of the periodic table, we have the periods and the groups in our table. So periods are the horizontal rows. Um, so when we go from left to right, um, that represents one period. And there are overall seven periods in the periodic table. So as you can see, they are also numbered on the side. So these are your periods. And for each period, your period number represents the number of orbit where all of the elements in that period has uh, their valence electrons in. So all of the elements that are in the same period, they all have same number of orbits, meaning all of the elements in period three are going to have three orbits. Um, groups, however, are the vertical columns. So you go from top to bottom. And then we have 18 groups in the periodic table. Um, groups, um, all of the elements that we have in the same group, they all have same number of valence electrons. And because they have same number of valence electrons, they also have similar properties. So um, you might get some questions that will be like, um, why do fluorine and chlorine have similar chemical properties? Your answer will be because they're in the same group and they have same number of valence electrons. In some questions, they might ask you um, very specifically, explain in terms of electrons why fluorine and chlorine have similar chemical properties. So your answer will be because they have same number of valence electrons. Um, and we know that because they're in the same group. Okay. Some other ways to kind of classify the uh, elements in the periodic tables is uh, in terms of metal, metalloids, and non-metals. So let's first look at the metals. <clears throat> so all of the elements that we see on the left of our periodic table, so all of these elements that are shaded, highlighted in yellow, these are the metals. So some of the things, some of the properties of metals that we uh, want to remember, by the way, these two lines that you see at the bottom, they are also metals, and they are just like emerging from um, these uh, transition metals. So if you notice, we stop at 57 here and then we continue at 72. So all of the elements between 57 and 72 are in here. So they are from 58 to 71. So same thing with the um, period seven elements at the bottom. So you can say that this, this is be, uh, because we don't have enough space to kind of to limit the space. Um, we decided to put these two rows at the bottom. Um, all right, um, coming back to the metals, some of the properties of metals that we want to be aware of is that metals tend to lose electrons because if you look at most of these 
uh, metals, they have less electrons in their valence shell, so it would be easier for them to lose those electrons to have a complete octet instead of gaining more electrons. So they also have a metallic luster, which means shine. They are very malleable, meaning it is, uh, and also ductile, meaning um, it, it is easy to kind of bend them in different shapes. Um, they're good conductors of heat and electricity, <clears throat> and they're mostly solids at room temperature, except mercury, which is a metal, but uh, it's a liquid at room temperature. So then your metalloids are represented by this um, pink highlighted part. So they are next to the, uh, uh, in your periodic table that's given in your reference table packet, they are next to the staircase. So you see this like bolded staircase here. Um, so all of the elements next to the staircase, they are your metalloids. So metalloids have properties that are similar to both metals and non-metals. So that's why they're kind of in the middle of the two. Um, so for these elements that are next to the staircase, almost all of them are metalloids. There are two exceptions. Um, and those two exceptions are aluminum and polonium. So as you can see, aluminum and polonium, both of them are um, highlighted as metals They're because they are both metals. They have metallic properties. Um, all righty. Next, let's talk, let's talk about the non-metal. So as you may or may not have guessed already, all of the elements that we see on the um, right-hand side of the periodic table are your non-metals. Now, as you can see, I have kind of highlighted the um, noble gases in this case, <clears throat> but there is a debate. Noble gases are not necessarily considered non-metals, um, but sometimes they are considered non-metals, so there's like a constant debate. Um, I should say non-metals here, by the way. Um, so let's talk about some of the properties of non-metals that we um, should be familiar with. Um, non-metals tend to gain electrons because if you look at more of them, most of them, they have a lot of valence electrons, so it's easier for them to gain electrons um, to have a complete octet instead of losing. And then they have no metallic luster, no shine to them. They are very brittle um, when they are in the solid phase. Um, and then they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. And normally, most of them are gases. Um, they are either molecular solids or they are network solids, meaning um, in most cases, do, they do not exist alone. Um, and then bromine is an exception, which is a liquid, uh, even though it's a non-metal at room temperature. So some more information that you should be familiar with, most reactive metal on the periodic table is francium, and most reactive non-metal on the periodic table is fluorine, okay? Let's talk about some more organization. So we're gonna look at some specific groups in the periodic table. So um, group one that you see, um, those are called the alkaline metals. Um, and these are extremely reactive. Um, and when they form compounds, those compounds are mostly soluble. Group two elements are called the alkaline earth metals. These are also very reactive, slightly less reactive than group one metals, uh, but they also form soluble <clears throat> and insoluble, both type of compounds. Um, and then we have group 3 to 12. Um, these are called the transition metals. The most important thing that you want to remember about transition metals is that when they are in solutions, they make colored solutions. Um, and then we also want to remember the group 17 elements. These are called the halogens, which are very reactive, um, non-metals. Um, and then they are mostly diatomic. Um, and lastly, we want to talk about the group 18 elements. These are your noble gases. They are stable, have a complete octet, so they absolutely do not react. Um, lastly, actually not lastly, lastly on this slide, we want to talk about the phases um, of the elements at room temperature. So there are only two liquids in the periodic table at room temperature. So those two are mercury and bromine that we have already talked about. And then we have very specific elements that are gases at room temperatures. Those are all of your noble gases. We have hydrogen, helium, 
um, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. And whatever elements are left after these liquids and solid, uh, liquids and gases, um, they are all solids at room temperature. All right. So next up, let's talk about the uh, periodicity or what we call the periodic trends, meaning what happens to the elements as we go down the group and across the period um, in terms of specific properties. So the first property that we are going to discuss is your um, atomic radius. So atomic radius is defined as the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons in an atom. So we are going to look at some examples. So we're going to look at lithium, sodium, and potassium that are in the same group. So that can help us uh, look at the trend going down the group. And then we are looking at lithium and fluorine that are in the same period. So this can help us look at the trend across the period. So if you talk about atomic radius going down the group, um, if you look at the Bohr's model, what we see happening is that we are <clears throat> um, increasing the atomic radius as we go down the drop. And that's because we see more orbits as we are going down. Um, so that means the outermost orbit or the valence shell is becoming farther and farther away from the nucleus. So there's less attraction from the nucleus. So that's why the atomic radius is going to increase. So <clears throat> remember that for these periodic trends, you don't just want to remember what's happening as you're going down the group or across the period. You also want to remember why is that happening, OK? As we go across the period, you compare lithium and fluorine, you can see that both of them have the same number of orbits. Um, so that might make you think that nothing's happening to the atomic radius. It's staying the same. However, your atomic radius is actually decreasing across the period. And that's because if you compare their nucleus, when you go from lithium to, to fluorine, the nucleus is becoming heavier. So you go from lithium to fluorine, right? So when the nucleus becomes heavier, that means there's more nuclear attraction. So the nucleus is going to attract the valence electrons more, and that is going to shrink the atom a little bit. So, um, Across the period, atomic radius decreases, as we explained, because there is there are more protons in the nucleus, so there's more nuclear attraction. Um, so you are given specific numbers for the atomic radius in table S. Um, so here's what those numbers look like. So as you can see, 130, 160, 200 going down the group. So they're increasing across the period. They are decreasing. Just one very, very quick thing that I do want to mention here is that these are called periodic trends for a reason. And the reason is trends are work in most cases. However, there can be a few exceptions. So there might be some cases where we'll say that atomic radius is um, decreasing across the period, but you might see that there are some variations to that. There are some exceptions to that. You might see an element um, or as you're going from any period as you're going from uh, left to right where um, there are two elements that are increasing their atomic radius instead of decreasing. And that's because um, there can be some exceptions to that trend sometimes. Okay, <clears throat> so just keep that in mind. Okay, next up, let's talk about the, um, we'll take a break from the periodic trends for now, because now that we're on the topic of the radius, let's talk about the ionic radius very, very quickly. So this is going to be, once again, the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons in an ion instead of the atom. So quick reminders, your ion is a charged particle, metals. Um, tend to lose electrons. So that means they're going to make the positively charged ion or the cation. Um, let me write that here. And then nonmetals tend to gain electrons. So they become the negatively charged ions or the anions. So um, if we are looking at a cation, which is losing electrons, here's like a very, very quick um, illustration of how the electrons are lost. So when the electron is lost, um, the cation is also losing its valence shell. So if you compare these two Bohr diagrams, it is very clear 
that in case of cations, the radius of the cation or the ion is less than the atom. If we, however, um, you can remember that by loss equals less. Um, if we, however, look at the anion where the electrons are gained, here's an illustration of that. What's happening in this case is that <clears throat> we now have more electrons in the valence shell. However, we still have same number of protons in the nucleus. Okay, so more electrons in the valence shell, but same number of protons in the nucleus. So because of that, there's going to be less nuclear attraction. So when there's less nuclear attraction, the atom is going to expand a little bit. And so the radius of the anion is going to be more than the atom. So you can remember that by gain equals greater radius. Okay. All right, so coming back to the periodic trends, we are not going to talk about the ionization energy. So um, ionization energy is the amount of energy that is required to lose an electron. So remember that the lower the ionization energy is, that means the easier it is for the electron to lose, I'm um, sorry, the easier it is for the atom to lose electrons. So if they go down, um, um, Quick reminders, metals want to lose their electrons, so that means they, in general, would need less energy to um, lose electrons. They're going to have lower ionization energies. Um, Non-metals, however, tend to gain electrons, so they are, in general, going to have uh, higher ionization energies. So if you look at down the drip, what we are going to <coughs> notice is that the valence orbit is becoming for, going farther and farther away from the nucleus, so that means it's most likely going to be easier for us to remove an electron from the valence shell. So we are going to need less energy to um, remove the valence electron. So down the grip, ionization energy is going to decrease. We need less energy to remove the electron. And same reason again. Number of orbits increases. We have more distance from the nucleus, less nuclear attraction, so it's easier for us to remove the electrons. Um, across the period, however, because now we have more nuclear attraction, so the ionization energy is going to increase because it's going to be very, very hard to break the nuclear attraction and remove an electron from the valence orbit. Um, also, remember that as we go from left to right, we are going towards non-metals, and non-metals do not want to lose their electrons, so it can be very hard to remove an electron from them. Um, so again, you will be given some values for the ionization energies in table S um, if the question is asking for a specific number. Let's talk about the electronegativity now, which is the ability to attract the electrons of other atoms. So if you say that something has a very high electronegativity, this should say electronegativity, um, that means um, this thing has the ability, more ability to attract the electrons. So once again, quick reminders, metals want to lose the electrons. If they want to lose the electrons, they do not want to attract other electrons. So they're going to have low electronegativities. Non-metals want to gain electrons. They're definitely going to attract the electrons of other atoms. So they have very high electronegativities. So when we are going down the drip, the, um, there's less nuclear attraction because atom is becoming bigger and bigger. So it's going to be very hard for the nucleus to attract the electrons on other atoms. So that's why ionization energy is going to decrease. When you're going across the group, now there's more nuclear attraction. That means there's going to be more attraction for the electrons. So ionization, uh, sorry, electronegativity increases. Um, also, as we go across the period, we are um, going towards more non-metals that do want to gain electrons. So they are going to attract more electrons. All right. Um, again, your values for electronegativities are also given in table S. All right. Um, lastly, let's talk about the metallic character. Metallic character means how likely is it for an element to behave like a metal? Um, quick reminders, metals tend to lose electrons. So if, um, for, in order for any element to behave as a metal, they need to have very low ionization energy, meaning they require less energy to remove electrons. 
and they also need to have very low electronegativities, meaning they should not um, want to attract the electrons and other atoms. So as we are going down the group, we notice um, that the electronegativity decreases and the ionization energy also decreases. Um, so it becomes very hard to attract other electrons. It becomes very easy to lose electrons. So that means down the group metallic character increases. As we go across the period, uh, we are going towards more non-metals. So it becomes easier to gain electrons and it becomes easier to, uh, it becomes harder to lose electrons. So that means metallic character is going to decrease. All right. So that was your, um, that was all the information that we need to know about periodic table. Um, good luck. I'll see you in the next one.